Thank you very much for inviting me to make a few comments at this webinar. We're living through a catastrophic situation in India, an education emergency, where hundreds of millions of children have been locked out of school and any meaningful learning opportunities for 20 months. Even in the state of Kerala, where I come from, and which is relatively advanced compared to many states, a PTA president told me, children have not written anything for 18 months. They have forgotten how to use a pen or pencil. And so in other states, the situation will be much more grim. Millions may not be able to read, let alone write. They may not have seen a written text. And the danger is that the real depth of this emergency will be glossed over and the urgent need to address the chronic underfunding of the public education system will be brushed aside. I will structure my comments around three issues. First, the trends in public financing in India for education, comparing them with international trends. Second, the growth in private education and the, therefore the deepening segregation of the Indian education system, despite the RTE provisions for promoting equity and whether we need to therefore revise these. And third, the specific funding issues that need to be addressed during this education emergency in order to reduce inequality. First, about the trends in public financing in India. What strikes you when you look at long-term trends is how remarkably constant education spending has been as a share of the budget and as a share of GDP. So if you look at the states and the UTs together, excluding the center, between 2004 and 2014-15, the share of the budget went from about 14% to 16%, and as a share of GDP, it went from 2.2% to 2.6%. But then in the years since 2014-15, the share of the budget went back to about 14%, and as a share of GDP, it remained roughly constant, 2.6% or so. So if we add the central government expenditures, the share of GDP will be slightly higher. But remember, a lot of that will be on central schools and central universities. So what is striking is that in the same period, for the lower middle income countries of the world, education expenditure as a share of GDP stayed at around 4.3%. That is almost 1.5% more than in India. And even in low-income countries, they increased their spending from 3.2% to 3.5% of GDP. Lower middle-income countries like Vietnam and Indonesia, which are like our comparators with the same per capita GDP in PPP terms, they spend about 19 to 20% of their budget compared to about 14% for us. So by any international comparison, India's spending is low. We're just similar to our neighbors, Pakistan, Bangladesh, Sri Lanka. And even compared to the normative uh, uh, norms that the UNESCO has put forward for achieving the SDGs, which suggest 4 to 6% of GDP and at least 15 to 20% of the budget, we are way off target. So this remarkable constancy in low levels of education spending seems to indicate a broad political consensus. And the Right to Education Act, unfortunately, has made no significant change to these trends, despite stipulating many conditions that are considered important for a reasonable learning environment and, reason and learning opportunities and to promote equity. So the second issue relates to the deepening inequality and segregation of the Indian education system which neither the RTE nor public funding seems to be reversing. The provisions of the RTE mandate, mandate certain schooling conditions that are supposed to promote equity. Of course, they're not followed, neither in government schools nor in private schools, though there are different reasons why that's the case. Private schools do not follow the infrastructure norms and often the teacher qualification norms. Government schools follow the teacher qualification norms due to recruitment rules most, in most cases, and often don't follow the infrastructure norms. Teachers in both types of schools continue to give private tuition. 
But there's one difference. Private school teachers are present in classes and they do not get used for non-academic duties as the RTE stipulates, while this is not the case with government schools. So despite the flouting of RTE norms in both types of schools, there continues to be a secular shift to the private schools in urban and rural areas throughout this last decades and in all states, as shown by the increase in number of private unaided schools and the share of enrollment in these schools. And a recent study by the RTE Resource Center at Indian Institute of Management Ahmedabad says that poor households indicate, quote, a high level of distrust in government schools, the author's own words. And they're willing to pay about 35% of their household expenditure for tuition fees. And this distrust is mainly on account of government teachers being used for other jobs and not fo being focused on teaching, even though parents know that government teachers are more qualified. But I also need to consider, I, I also think we need to consider what else parents value, rightly or wrongly, in private schools. One is the focus on English in these schools, so-called focus, but that's what parents value. The second is so-called discipline and perhaps the more homogenous social composition, whether on caste, religion, re or socioeconomic basis, and possibly things like computer skills and so on. So what's happening is that anybody who can escape a government school generally tends to, and this is leading to the segregation and deepening inequality in the education system. But it also lowers the public pressure for increased public funding for the government schools, for those who are in the disadvantaged uh, groups, which actually is about 60-70% still of enrollment, uh, because only the poorest and the most disadvantaged are in the government schools. And as we try to enforce the provisions of the RTE and link budgeting more closely to what this right envisages, I think we may need to look at what's, what is really valued. Uh, infrastructure is certainly important, but so is the actual teaching time by teachers, the time for students, the teaching of English by trained language teachers, digital skills training of students, and so on. Funding norms should be based on this. Kerala recently revised its teaching of English and IT skills and improved infrastructure in high-tech schools. And we do see children returning to government schools. So finally, let me turn to the question of funding for the education emergency, which has accentuated the problem of chronic underfunding of the education system and which will further deepen the inequality in the system unless we take corrective action by focusing funding on specific activities that address the inequality in learning opportunities. The fact that education spending was cut in many states and at the center during this fiscal year in this situation is truly incredible. India is one of the few countries that did this and further, now, we may have pressure from the private schools as children return to government schools because they can't pay the fees. So if we are really to bridge the inequality gap and overcome the disadvantages that the poor has, have suffered during this emergency, we need to ensure not only that there's increased public funding, but also that there's enhanced funding for disadvantaged children in government and aided schools and for specific things related to their learning deprivation. So these should include, in our opinion, one, increased nutrition, as malnutrition will affect the child's overall development and hence the educational progress. Two, family economic support due to the increase in poverty and the likelihood of children supporting their families. Three, expenditures related to reorganizing and strengthening the curriculum, teacher training and ongoing support for teachers and additional learning materials because children will be at different levels. Four, resources for extending the instructional time, for instance, on weekends and during vacation, using additional teachers or teacher aides. Five, 
re-enrollment drives, and finally, monitoring and reporting on how the emergency is being addressed and how inequality is being reduced. This has to be a multi-year program. This deep crisis cannot be overcome through short-term bridge courses and just moving along children to grades. So equity in this context, and this is what I want to emphasize, does not mean equal conditions for all, but more funding for the disadvantaged. There should be real-time monitoring of what state governments are allocating and how they're spending the money, and I believe that this will also help us move the conversation into what constitutes an equitable quality education for all. Thank you very much.